We have another long trip ahead of us involving missing aircraft, strange vegetables and famous explorers. So let's join Liz Truswell in Canberra as our guide. The recent search for the missing Malaysian aircraft MH370 has focused remarkably on a region in the southern Indian Ocean that's been called a twilight zone in terms of our knowledge of the seas. The most significant land in this vast area is the Caguelan Archipelago, a complex of rugged islands some 3,000 kilometres southwest of Fremantle, one of the most isolated land masses on Earth. In relation to the search for the airliner, Kerguelen has probably had more mentions in the world's press than ever before, even in the Wall Street Journal. These are seldom positive references. They stress the remoteness and desolation of these islands. A quick Google reveals some wild theories. Did the missing aircraft actually land on Kerguelen? Or wilder still, did some whirling force generated by the Earth's magnetic field drag the plane down into the ocean depths close to Kerguelen? In spite of its forbidding bleakness and isolation, a host of stories, both of human history and the natural environment, swirl about these islands. They include tales of the early navigators who discovered them, the adventures of seal hunters and whaling captains who plundered the island's wildlife. There is, too, the story of a young naturalist who was soon to make his mark on the scientific stage of the 19th century, along with his friend and colleague, Charles Darwin. The Australian, Douglas Mawson, also spent time on Kerguelen en route to Antarctica. And there's the story of a vegetable, a cabbage, which doesn't rank highly among gourmands today, but which enters the story of one of the most debilitating diseases, scurvy, the scourge of early sailors. But what's the reality of these islands? The main island, Grand Terre, is surrounded by some 300 smaller islands and rocky outcrops forming the archipelago. Their ragged coastlines are cut by myriad fjords and inlets. They lie in the path of the roaring forties and the climate is raw, chilly and windswept, with rain and snow throughout the year. The landscape is bleak and treeless. Kerguelen is administered by France, which maintains a scientific base there. The islands were discovered by the French navigator Yves Joseph de Kerguelen Tremarec in February 1772. Although Kerguelen Tremarec himself failed to land, the captain of his accompanying vessel did so and named the land La France Australe, claiming it for France. Kerguel and Tremarec reported his discovery enthusiastically to King Louis XV of France, believing the islands to be the northern tip of Terra Australis, the fabled Great South Land. He predicted the land would be arable, rich in wood and minerals, indeed a worthy prize for France. Louis XV was not impressed and sent his navigator back the following year, whereupon Tremarec, who again failed to land, was forced to admit the islands were desolate and of no value to France. He was sent to prison for four years for his ineptitude. James Cook visited the islands in the course of his third expedition in December 1776. Landing in the bay he called Christmas Harbour, he named the complex the Isles of Desolation. William Anderson, surgeon on Cook's vessel, made a collection of the island's flora, including one cabbage-like plant. After their discovery, the islands were regularly visited by whalers and sealers hunting fur and elephant seals. Among them was John Nunn, an Englishman. With three companions, he was shipwrecked there in 1825 when their vessel foundered in a steep-sided bay. The group survived on the island for more than two years, building a hut of turf they called Hope Cottage. Fortified by a Bible and a book of poetry, they lived on seabird eggs, seal meat and cabbage before their eventual rescue by another whaling ship. Douglas Mawson visited the islands in 1930 on his way to the coast of East Antarctica to map and proclaim that territory for Australia. Ever the scientist, Mawson found the islands to be of extraordinary interest, describing Kerguelen as this wonderful island. Aiding Mawson in his scientific observations was the veteran Antarctic photographer Frank Hurley, who filmed the island from a seaplane, a de Havilland moth that took off and landed from one of the many fjords.
Geologically, the islands are one of the emergent points of a vast submarine plateau, three or four times the size of the British Isles. Most of the plateau lies in water up to four kilometres deep and has been built by volcanic eruptions coming from a stationary hotspot where molten magma from deep within the earth rises to the surface. When a tectonic plate moves across the hotspot, chains of volcanic islands are formed. Heard and MacDonald are part of the same chain. On Kerguelen itself, volcanic lava flows are stacked one on top of another to form mountain slopes, monumental striped terraces where black rock alternates with snow cover. In between are beds of brown coal which have been mined briefly in the past. There are fossil tree trunks, some over two metres long, belonging to the conifer family that includes the hoop and the wallamai pines of Australia, showing a woodland once covered the islands. But it was the modern vegetation of Kerguelen, the low-growing cover of mosses and lichens that fascinated the young naturalist Joseph Dalton Hooker, and which was to serve him well as he strove to follow in the footsteps of his idol and role model, Charles Darwin. Joseph Hooker, then 22 years old, spent two and a half months there in 1840 when he sailed as botanist on the voyage of the English expedition to Antarctica under James Clark Ross in the vessels Erebus and Terra. This voyage aimed to establish magnetic observatories at sites in the southern hemisphere and to find the position of the South Magnetic Pole. But the British were acutely aware that the French were already exploring the Antarctic regions, so there was a strong element of national pride in the instructions given by the Royal Society. Joseph had recently graduated in medicine from the University of Glasgow. His passion was for botany rather than medicine, and in this he was encouraged by his father, William Hooker, professor of botany in Glasgow, later director of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. But Botany wasn't considered an acceptable profession in the early 19th century. Thus, young Joseph, in order to follow his passion, had to complete a medical degree, although it did include some botany. He was first appointed assistant surgeon to Ross's expedition. With a measure of precocious cheek, Joseph lobbied to have the appointment changed to that of naturalists, sensing that otherwise he wouldn't have much opportunity to get ashore pursuing his scientific ambitions. Ross, bending the naval rules a little, eventually offered him the informal, slightly inferior position of botanist, ensuring him ample time ashore. Joseph did some plant collecting on the islands of Cape Verde and St Helena, but these were places where extensive collections had already been made and little was new to science. It was on Kerguelen that he was able to become something of a pioneer in the field, happily devoting much of his time in this bleak locality to collect 150 species of the local flora, doubling the collections on Cook's voyage. The plants Hooker collected were mostly lowly lichens and mosses, the cryptogams. Often he had to retrieve these by hammering out pieces of the rocks on which they grew, sometimes sitting on the little plants to thaw them out. Flowering plants are less common on Kerguelen, but among them is the cabbage-like plant already noted. The extended period of plant collecting on Kerguelen provided Joseph with multiple rewards. First, he finally pleased his father. William Hooker was a strict botanist of the old school and enjoyed a high profile in the scientific community. He was anxious his son should follow his own disciplined approach to science, and before the expedition left, he advised Joseph to focus more sharply on particular groups of plants, and he suggested the non-flowering plants, the cryptogams, as these were dominant in lands of high southern latitudes. Kerguelen provided Joseph with such an opportunity. Throughout the voyage of some four years, Sir William kept up a correspondence with his son constantly urging the young man to adhere to the most rigorous of scientific methods. He was not impressed by the collections made on Cape Verde and St Helena, urging that Joseph collect specimens in quantities, not driblets. But the plants and the notes that eventually arrived from Kerguelen drew his father's approval, and he wrote, Believe me, dear boy, they've given me infinite pleasure. 
they prove you must have been diligent and consequently successful. And later, I expected much of you, but these have far exceeded my expectations and do you credit. His detailed work on Kerguelen also provided Joseph with the opportunity to think more broadly about his science, to venture into what he called philosophical botany. It sparked his interest in the wider issues of plant distribution. The flora of Kerguelen, he observed, was more like that of distant Tierra del Fuego than to the closer islands of New Zealand. His ideas on the ways in which plants might have migrated from their points of origin he explored more fully in his monumental botany of the Antarctic voyage. Kerguelen was thus to Joseph Hooker what the Galapagos Islands were to Charles Darwin. Hooker was to enjoy a protracted correspondence and a close friendship with Darwin, eventually becoming a key supporter, urging the publication of The Origin of Species. But what of the Kerguelen cabbage, the rather dramatic plant first reported by Anderson on Cook's voyage? He described it as having the watery, acid taste of antiscorbutics. It was used to supplement the meals of seal meat for Cook's crews. Anderson named the plant Pringlia after John Pringle, president of the Royal Society. Scurvy has killed more sailors in the British Navy than enemy action. But prevention and a cure linked to the use of fresh produce was known long before it was acted on. The Scottish physician James Lynn in 1747 undertook clinical trials on groups of sailors dying of the disease and prescribed the use of two oranges and one lemon to be given every day. It was another 50 years before the British Admiralty adopted this treatment. James Cook, from the time of his first Pacific voyage in 1768, was clearly well aware of the curative value of fresh produce, although sauerkraut and malt were his chosen preventatives. Thus, it's no surprise that his surgeon, William Anderson, recognised the potentially antiscorbutic properties of the cabbage-like plant he encountered on Kerguelen in 1776. But it was Joseph Hooker who provided a full description and a superb illustration of the plant, giving it the species name, Antiscorbutica. He collected seeds, which he sent to his father at Kew, where they failed to germinate, although Hooker Jr. had succeeded in growing the plants aboard the Erebus, a fact where he reported to his father with some triumph. Again, during the stay of this expedition, the cabbage was served to the ship's crews, and Hooker wrote in his report of, This important vegetable, in great abundance of essential oil, it never produces heartburn or any of the disagreeable sensations that its namesake is apt to do. The root tastes like horseradish. The young leaves or hearts resemble in flavour coarse mustard and cress. For 130 days, our crews required no fresh vegetable but this, which was for nine weeks regularly served with salt beef or pork, during which time there was no sickness on board. We don't know how willingly the ship's crews really partook of this delicacy. There have been efforts to grow Kerguelen cabbage in Australia, notably at the Australian National Botanic Garden, but none's been successful enough to indicate it might be a commercial proposition and popular with the public, although an official taster in the Australian experiment did suggest it might go nicely with smoked salmon and lemon. So for the present, it's just one part of the Kerguelen story of which there are plenty, and we'll have more on those hookers, father and son, in a science show series in January. Liz Truswell is a visiting fellow at the Department of Earth Sciences, ANU in Canberra. Next week, Dr. Gary Egger runs again. I'm Robin Williams.